These skill scrolls belong in a museum. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And today we are talking about chapter 12, Patience. <laughs> but before we get in to the chapter, we would like to give a couple shout outs and thank yous. We would like to thank Michelle on Instagram for messaging us. Um, she let us know that she thought that Molly didn't want to be kissed. She had always thought that she was reacting to um, the unpleasant talk about the forged people before, um, which is not something that I had ever read it as, but I thought that was an interesting take. Um, and she also let us know that um, Lady Patient's name is different in Germany. It's actually um, <laughs> Princessin Fila. Sorry, my German isn't super great. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But uh, basically, it translates to, um, Fila translates to love, she told us, um, which I think is really interesting that they didn't even pick the same name for the German translation. But it was just a fun little chat about names. Um, Jesse also messaged us on Instagram to talk about how we think Chade is pronounced. Um, there is a debate whether it's shade or chade. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm, Robin Hobb has never really been straight out with how you pronounce names because it's kind of an individual thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always under the impression that it's kind of somewhere in between those two, like the hard ch and the sh. Uh, I the first time I read it, or the first couple times I always go back to it, I start by saying Chade, like, pretty hard. And then when the fool tar starts, you know, equating his name with Shade and using that interchangeably to make riddles, it always kind of flips in my mind. So I'm I'm trying to go in the middle of that as, like, a Chade, like, a really <laughs> soft in-between, but uh, I kind of use them interchangeably myself. Yeah. It's definitely one of those things where I'm not really sure if I say it the right way, but that's just how it is in my head. Also, I feel like Chade is just trying to be edgy with <laughs> not going exactly by Shade. But she did bring up a good point that um, it could, if it was pronounced Shade, it would follow more in the tradition of um, the name, how the people in the duchy's culture name their children, especially royals. Right. And we know it wasn't his actual name. It was something that he gave Fitz. Um, but he's been known as that for a while, so he, he might have taken it, that name onto himself, and he doesn't go by what his mother named him anymore. Yeah. And then we got a very interesting email from Shane. Um, he wanted to point out that he thinks that maybe the Farseers are descended from elderlings um, who used the skill pillars to escape to Buck from Kelsingra or maybe any of the other uh, elderling towns whenever the whole cataclysm events were going on where right. back in the day. He also brings up um, the possibility that the Out Islanders, because of their proximity to Eslevjal and the other elderling city out there, or whoever was living in that area, they could have kind of inherited some skill by proximity, just kind of like Rain and Malta get communicated through the dragons, mm -hmm. um, even when Tintaglia is still in her cocoon, and how the Rain Wild peoples are being changed just by being around that area. Well, they also... It is, I think, said somewhere that the Rainwild people are changed with the growths because they're disturbing the Elderling artifacts and they're dabbling with dragon magic that they don't know how to control. Um, and as far as we know, the Out Islanders don't really dabble with any sort of right, artifacts. Back in the day when they moved, they might have been closer by. They might have, yeah, you know, definitely. interacted with that city and um, 
Shane's thought was that because of the elderlings having to move because of the cataclysms, they might have, you know, started mingling and uh, mixing their bloodlines with the out islanders mm-hmm. out there. And that's where the, uh, the skill blood came from. Yeah. I definitely like the idea that maybe the original people in Buck were fleeing elderlings. Um, or at least the, that the farseers descend from. And, uh, with that, I kind of followed his line of logic and I, I kind of like some of that. Um, I, I replied to him, but I kind of want to talk about it with you on here as well, that we know the elderlings were warlike. They had Mm -hmm. warriors. They fought different civilizations with one another. Um, and they had conflicts. They weren't always intermingling. They weren't one nation. So when the cataclysm ha- came and they had to flee to different areas and split up, my continuation of that logic was that, yes, one group went to Eslevjal and probably mixed with the out-islanders there. One group probably went to Buck. But they were completely different and hadn't really had relationships with one another before. Mm -hmm. Because we also know that uh, the Farseer line has skill and they can work with silver, which, based on everything that we learn in the Rainwild Chronicles, silver's kind of toxic and it's not very good and elderlings in particular seem to have a vulnerability to it. Right. Because they have to have, like, you know, the special gloves that are made of dragon hide and things like that. And they have to be super trained yeah. to use it. So with that, with being trained, it seems that they're, they were developing some kind of, you know, affinity for silver, which mm-hmm. has been called liquid skill. But some of the otherlings didn't have that ability to do that. So my kind of thought is these two separate nations of elderlings... They were kind of each developing their own uh, proto-skill users that couldn't actually directly use that. Mm -hmm. They just had these very small inborn abilities within a a subsection of their populations. They fled to these different areas. And then since they mingled with the local people there, after a while, their blood kind of got spread out. And when those two bloodlines met, that's when the skill happens. Definitely interesting. Now, that is taking a lot of leaks. Uh, that is taking a lot of leaps of logic. But, you know. Yeah. It's always fun to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I really wish we had more definitive things on, like, the, orig- the origin of the skill and um, the origin of the Farseers. Yes. In, you know, in its complete history. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very nice. And finally, we have an email from Keith. And Keith talks about how we might have a history of Taker. Um, Yeah. There is an intro to a chapter in The Fool's Fate where we hear about a Out Islander legend. Um, Yeah, it's not like it's not like a full history or anything, but it's a story that they tell. About that area. About a disgraced out islander who um, is a very trash person. <laughs> he <laughs> wants to marry somebody from the Gull Clan and he ends up, um, they, she rebuffs him, so he ends up um, destroying the clan's people and land. Um, yeah, no it says he was almost a hero, and then um, with that whole thing, he really he he disrespected the mother house that of the gull clan and um killed and raped some of their women and when news got back to his own mother house they excommunicated them and his crew and you know sent reparations over to the other mother house but he was no longer allowed to set foot on land yeah he uh, on any out islander land Mm -hmm. um which would explain and they don't say who this person is but it would explain taker because he is weary from traveling we know so he would have maybe that's why he came to buck keep because he literally had nowhere else to go right um and he also points out that the reason this would have 
been excluded from the buck telling of Taker is because it's not super great to know that your leader was excommunicated and a trash person. Right. Um, so it would explain why they don't talk too much about him and why he's not necessarily looked highly on. Also, he brought up that in our chapter 10 discussion, we thought that Chade might be getting an inkling that Fitz had the wit when he, they were talking about the forged ones and how right. Fitz couldn't feel him. Uh, he thought that maybe Chade immediately went to the skill as a thought and is like, oh, maybe Fitz is developing some, you know, uh, affinity and use of the skill because he immediately starts talking about how Fitz needs to get trained in it. Right. Because he, he kind of leads with the oh i can feel i can't feel these people but i can feel other people and shade's like are you crazy and then like the next scene is hey we need to get you trained in the skill which i thought uh when i was first reading it was a reaction to how crazy things were getting and mm-hmm. just like we need all the weapons we can get kind of thing right but that would make sense it would follow a little bit of logic there yeah i definitely like that take Um, And I told him, as well as I will tell you, sometimes I think I give Shade a little bit too much credit um, just because he seems so knowledgeable. We are reading from Fitz's point of view. So from his point of view, he always seems so knowledgeable and like he knows almost everything. Um, And so sometimes I take put a little bit too much and weight on Shade's abilities, I think. But um. Other than those specific topics, um, thank you to everyone else who has been commenting and emailing to tell us that they like the podcast. Um, it really makes our day hearing that you guys like what we do. Yeah, I, I, I do really appreciate it. We both really appreciate everything that we hear. So, yeah, thank you again. So let's dive into Chapter 12. We get a little bit more about... Uh, The mysterious noble woman (laughs) who acts like a maid. And looks like a girl. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, The beginning part, though, is uh, more discussion on the Red Ship Raiders, kind of their origins. uh, What Fitz kind of learns later and puts down into words gives a little bit more context to what we're dealing with in the first book, in the first two books. Right. And it kind of discusses that the Red Ship Raiders before they were even known in Buck, had been raiding and doing this practice in the Out Islands for a long time. Mm -hmm. And by the time that they had come to Buck, they pretty much had subjugated all the Out Islands or anybody that were against them were either killed or had run away. away. Mm -hmm. Right. And they had been forging the people of the Out Islands. Um, And it says that hard-hearted and cruel as we consider the out islanders to be they have in their tradition a strong vein of honor and heinous penalties for those who break the kin rules um so it is weird that they're allowing people to um join in with these people who seemingly have no honor and are so ruthless but we also know that if they don't their people are getting forged and it's not great yeah, um, I mean, he kind of goes into that more in the paragraph where if you get forged, because they have such strong honor amongst themselves of their rules, basically, and their uh, penalties for if you, you know, defy those rules, if your loved ones or your son, for example, in here is forged and they, you know, steal from their mother house, they have no moral compass anymore, they they hit somebody, they have to either cover up those crimes, you know, um, devaluing their own honor and the honor of their mother house, or say that their own son did that, mm-hmm. and then kill them. And then you get rid of your heir, you get rid of anything. So forging is terrible no matter what, but it takes a huge hit in an honor-based society like the Out Islands. Right. Um, but I do think it's interesting that the Out Islanders are known to be, like, cruel, I guess. It just... I wonder if that's more of a cultural difference 
I um, think so, yeah. Rather than they actually think these people are monsters. I mean, the six duchies are barbarous. But, <laughs> so That's true. They have they don't even have glass in their windows. True. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of dive straight in then to Fitz kind of putting from his mind uh the woman, but also stating to us that I met her twice more. Like in yeah. quick succession. Yeah, before he knew who she was. Yep. Uh, he says that he went out for a night of tavern music with Dirk and uh, Carrie. So yeah. that's one of the first times we see them mentioned for a while. And that's one of his old crew that he ran with, his yeah. new boy. So I'm sure he just hasn't been talking about right. spending time with them. But it is kind of fun to know that he does still hang out with them. Seems a little odd that a bunch of 14-year-olds are in a tavern. But hey. <laughs> I think I think they did mention when he was a child and went with him that he was the youngest one there. That's fair. So I think I think they're probably more around Molly's age at like 16. That would be my guess, at least. I guess. I mean, I know in Europe, I think the drinking age is 16, right? It so depends on the country. 16 to 18. So maybe that's not so weird. But. I don't know. It just feels odd for 14. 14 is so young. That's like just barely a teenager. You don't even know how to drive yet. It's, I don't know. (laughs) So he says he was neither dizzy nor sick, but he was placing his feet carefully because he had had at most two mugs more of ale than he should have. (laughs) And I just think this is funny because we know by the end of this, he's throwing up. So <laughs> yeah. I just like how it progressively goes from, I wasn't that drunk to I threw up. <laughs> he had taken uh, one tumble already in the road on the way back. Mm-hmm. And he knows that if he went to bed right now, that he would throw up just staring at the ceiling and getting progressively dizzier. So he goes to the women's garden. Right. Where somebody confronts him after he like, washes his face and is trying to clear his head and she's like are you drunk and he doesn't know that this is the lady that he saw before he thinks it's tilly an orchard girl so he makes a a funny little quip back and Mm -hmm. do you think this is trying to be a little flirty or do you think this is just i think it's just drunken confidence of like yeah (laughs) not really not really yeah (laughs) Not quite enough time or coin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the lady, Lady Patience, it immediately goes to blaming Burek for this. Yeah. I suppose you learned it from Burek. The man is a sot and a lecher, and he has cultivated like traits in you. Ever he brings those around him down to his level. Harsh words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, immediately out the gate with that. And I think, like, so some of the history of Beric and Patience, because this is talked about, you know, hinted around, I guess, for a while. Mm -hmm. But Beric met Patience when they were uh, younger, about the same age as uh, Fitz is now. He brings Mm -hmm. this up and talks about this a little bit later on in the chapter. But they fell in love. And I believe that Beric chose... To serve chivalry over pursuing Lady Patience. One, probably because of their class difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later, chivalry and Patience fall in love and marry. There, there's a falling out between Burek and Patience, and I'm sure now Patience kind of blames him a little bit for uh, chivalry, you know, having a one night stand, even if it's misplaced and, mm-hmm. and not, you know, justified anger. It's just like, Beric is the one who brought my chivalry down and influenced him with his bad ways. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um. It says that the bitterness in the woman's voice made me look up. And at first glance, she seemed to be little more than a girl. Slender, less tall than Fitz, and he wasn't tall for his age. Yeah. Which really surprised me because I didn't ever in my head picture Lady Patience as small or like smaller than Fitz. Right. She has such like an engaging and 
I, I'm not, I don't want to say commanding personality because she's not really commanding, but she's just very... Uh, present? Yeah. She's very present and she's always visible in every scene that she's in. Yeah. So it, it, in my head, she was, you know, I don't know, maybe like average height or whatever. I never really like pictured her as a small woman. Yeah. I guess I, I also forget that she's described as so short. Um... But I do kind of like being reminded that she is this little fiery woman. I don't know. I just, it it fits her. <laughs> it says that she looks little, like little more than a girl. Um, how old is she here? Do we know for sure? Oh, I haven't actually done like any digging around into that. I would assume around Burek and Chivalry's age, although she might be a little bit younger. I know she's younger because Burek later talks about how it was like this young girl that he saw when he was a little bit older than Fitz. Mm. So she would have had to have been. But I just don't... Because, I mean, maybe it's just because she's so small that she comes off looking like a girl, but... So she could be around like 30 right now or so. Right. And some people just have baby faces, so yeah, not necessarily that she might, she's... Yeah, she actually might be older than... I would say 30 is like a base guess for me. Okay. But I could be wrong. Fitz goes on to um, kind of defend Burek, but he's like, it's not because, you know, I was actually defending him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's definitely starting to go through the awkward teenager phase where you kind of resent your parents and yep. you're very moody. I mean, he has some reasons for it, but he's definitely True. through that phase right now. Uh huh. I just think that it's funny to watch this chapter specifically, his little Burek comments. <laughs> but he says that Burek could, you know, scarcely be responsible for what he puts into his mouth since he's, you know, far away at the moment. And Patience is kind of asking, like, but he never taught you anything against drinking and. Thank you. Finally, a woman who knows when to point out when someone is wrong. (laughs) This is who he needed in his life all along, because you know what? It is a fair assessment that Burek is the reason he is a 14 year old that is drunk. So all all I'm saying is she's not wrong. (laughs) Fitz does go in and and say that uh, uh, he would be greatly displeased with me at the moment. But then he only talks about the manners. But I think right. Burek would be upset with him for both. <laughs> for the manners and being a little bit drunk. But would he be? Because he he is the same person who got 12-year-old Fitz drunk to deal with his sadness. So... I think that's more because Burek knows the depth of the sadness he was going through. Okay. Because he... I mean, he lost... I don't know. I think I think it was more because of like the actual like physical pain and, and Birik needed it as well. Okay. I guess I just assumed because of that that Birik is very um I don't know okay with the idea of drowning your feelings in alcohol. So I think Birik's okay with himself doing that. <laughs> but Fitz has to be held to a higher standard. Yeah, because he has, you know, royal blood in him okay (laughs) but uh fitz kind of like is very flowery in his language and he stands up the drunken confidence of a young boy and he's Mm -hmm. like oh good day to you and walks out and then ignores her calling after him and then goes and throws up like you said yep (laughs) kind of falls asleep in a clean stable and then it mentions that he wakes up uh, amazingly resilient especially when feeling threatened because he knew Birk was coming <laughs> and it, that feeling is is amazing because you know like you're doing something that's putting off other chores that you have and it's just something for your own pleasure even if it's not like a party or anything like that and you know your parents are gonna come back home later that day or the next mm-hmm. day and you have to wake up and you're like oh crap I have to do everything now <laughs> <laughs> make sure they don't know yep so Bjork is finally coming back. Uh, we learned that he has only been gone for a little over a month. Yep. Which is a long time. It is. It, it's like a weirdly long time. But I guess if you're trying to figure out what's ailing 
It was cattle? I think it was cattle, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you might want to make sure that it actually works, whatever you're giving them. Um, but he decides he probably better change his shirt that he's been wearing for three days. <laughs> Because it's Fitz. <laughs> he didn't have to see Molly. She didn't tell him that he smelled bad. <laughs> he probably only saw, saw her two days in a row, and the shirt probably wasn't terrible then. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't know. Uh, but he is stopped for his second his second encounter by the mysterious lady. <laughs> right outside of his door. Uh-huh. And the first thing she says... Change your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then she adds... Those leggings make you look like a stork. <laughs> Tell Mr. Hasty they need replacing. <laughs> oh, it's just so I love it. I love patience so much anyway, but Do you oh. think uh what are what are the encounters do you think? Do you think that she was seeking him out? Do you think that they were random? The first encounter in this chapter, I think she saw him. And maybe from her window, maybe she was in the kitchen hoping to see him again. Um, but she's like mentioned as wearing kind of night clothes, it seemed like. Um, so that one felt like she saw him and went to go talk, talk to him um, on purpose. The second one, I don't necessarily think she was seeking him out on purpose, per se, but... I definitely think she knew she was by his room and wanted to see how he was doing after the night before where he was drinking heavily. I think I'm I think so too. I think that's pretty much correct. The only other thought I had was maybe instead of like seeing him and then going up to the following him up to the women's garden that she was already there like working. Oh yeah. And just yeah. kind of like saw him wander in, but That's fair. It does say that she's in just a simple shift, so who knows? Yeah. I can I'm... see her doing both. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> uh. So after she tells him that he looks ridiculous and needs to change, um, he, in good humors, says, good morning, lady. Um, because he doesn't really know what to do, <laughs> what to say. She's basically lady time to him. <laughs> And she, he decides the best course is to humor her. Um, she kind of goes on a a big rant of demands, wondering, like, you know, do you play a musical instrument? Do you sing? Have you been taught to recite the epics and knowledge of verses, of herbs and healings and navigation, that sort of thing? Yeah. And Fitz just has to be like, no. <laughs> I no. know. <laughs> I love that. She then is like, oh, well, then you must dance. You know, if you don't have any of those talents, you have to dance. And then that's when Fitz is like, oh, I think you have the wrong person. <laughs> you might want my cousin, uh, August, the king's nephew. And she's like, no, I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> and then he kind of says that those teachings are reserved for people who are well born. Right. And he's not been taught them. And at each of the denials of those demands and questions, she appeared more troubled, it says. And just is getting angrier and angrier and says, just this will not be tolerated and storms off. Right. Do you think she went to his room to ask him about those things? No. I don't, from what we know of who Lady Patience is, I don't think she had a set plan. I think it just kind of came to her in the moment because of how he was dressed. And that's not, that that's not how a young prince should be dressed. Well, what else does he not know? Because he's obviously not taught, been taught how to not drink and right. <laughs> change his clothes regularly. Um, and so I think it was more just a train of thought than a pl pre-planned, I'm going to find out what he knows. I think the, I don't think she's a very, um, yeah, a planning person. Mm -hmm. I was going to say thoughtful. She's a thoughtful person, but she's not a very well thought out person, I right. should say. <laughs> um, I think that 
yes, she purposely sought him out, but these things have been in her mind for a while. Mm-hmm. And they not, just all kind of... Yeah, not as specific questions, maybe. Right. Um, but she has wanted Fitz as a son. She has wanted a child in general mm-hmm. for a long, long time. And um, she's wanted to know Fitz for a while. And I think she just wants any part of chivalry she can. And now that it's in front of her... She wants to know that he's getting the right and the education that she thinks any son of chivalry should have. Right. Because in her mind, like, it's a son of chivalry. This is a prince. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) like, it's it's really interesting because she thinks that everybody else should agree with her that, like, yeah, it's he's, you know, a son of royalty. Right. Get treated the same. Get educated. Everyone should get educated anyways, but, like, he's the son of chivalry. <laughs> right. Do this. Why isn't this happening? Which is, seems to be very her personality, that everybody should just agree with her <laughs> and just know, the, agree that this is how things should work. Exactly. Um, but um, after she leaves, Fitz goes in and changes and puts on his <laughs> longest leggings. <laughs> so... Apparently, what she said rubbed off. (laughs) And Beer comes back. Yeah. Takes a little tour of the stable, demanding, you know, a rerun of everything that's happened in the month. Mm -hmm. Um, He does mention that Fitz has grown. Yep. And then he looks him over with a critical eye, as if I were a horse or hound that was showing unexpected potential. Do you think it's because he missed him, and this is basically his son? Yeah, I think so. Plus, um... I think he's just becoming more and more like chivalry as he's growing up because mm. like he's losing, you know, some of the, uh, the kid fat, he's, yeah. you know, like you mentioned last episode, he's going through puberty probably, or has been through it mm-hmm. and he's probably just gaining more muscle. He's looking a lot more like his father. Right. And this is probably a, around the age that Bjork met his father anyway, or Fitz's age now is probably around the age that Beric met that, Chivalry yeah. at. So it would probably be pretty close to what he looked like, if we can believe what everybody else says. <laughs> and there's a little bit of mention of, sometimes it surprised me how much like Shade he could be after mm-hmm. Beric demanded him to report to him. And it's... Uh, it just goes back to like all the conversations and like the discussions that we've had in the past couple chapters comparing them together. Yeah. Because they they are very very similar in how they act even if they say that they're like the opposite. Uh-huh. They have different morals, but they're both very strong moral-based people, I think. Yeah, and he also mentions that uh years later that's how uh a soldier would report to his superior. That's how he was taught by both Beric and Shade, although Shade made it more formal. Right. And uh, I think that's really interesting one because Beric was a soldier for a while, mm-hmm. and that's how he would report to chivalry. Uh, but he was probably less formal in general because they were friends. Right. Shade made it much more formal because he was a teacher and he was taught the actual, you know, regimented way, I'm sure, as right. one, an assassin's apprentice when he was a kid, and two, as a prince. So he knows, like, the actual, you know, way to do things. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, the years later, I think is, you know, just next book, when he <laughs> becomes... Uh, a soldier on the ships that are defending against the raiders. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. But I, I would agree. Yeah, because he's not like an actual soldier ever. Well, he, isn't he? I mean, he, he fights. He in does the take war. up like yeah. He he fights. In, that's what I mean though. Like the the next the next book, he fights against the red ship raiders. But beyond after that, he's never an actual soldier until he's Tom Badgerlock as a guardsman. And that is just, like, personal guard things, and that's Mm -hmm. after he wrote this. So I'm kind of curious of, like, was it that? But that's, you know, coming up very quickly. I... Or did he learn more in between there? I feel like Fitz has always had this interesting relationship 
with kind of idolizing men at arms. Yeah. Um, true. He really seems to look up to them. And I mean, he was kind of raised around them. He ate with them. Um, so you could see how he would admire them growing up. Um, but I think that he would definitely consider himself, especially at the age he was at when writing this, he would consider himself to have been a man at arms because he is fighting in a war. He's learning stuff. He talks about it all the time. So it obviously was a big thing for him. And I wonder if he kind of inflates this sense of being a man at arms because it was the only time when he wasn't just an assassin. He wasn't a a field or a farmhand. He wasn't an assassin. He he was accepted by a group of people that were his peers as well. Mm-hmm. And he was good at being yeah. a soldier. Um, and so I kind of feel like that's why forever he is always talking so fondly about when he was a soldier. Yeah, yeah. So Birk is taking this tour of the stables. Mm -hmm. And he comes upon the palfrey, Lady Patience's horse, and stops and stands there for like a minute, a couple minutes, just like quiet, staring. Mm -hmm. It's like, I I trained this horse. It's silk. Horse recognizes him, of course. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And then he breaks the news. (laughs) Yep. Lady Patience. The Lady Patience is here. (laughs) Has she seen you yet? (laughs) <laughs> and it's it's Fitz's turn to be speechless. He's like, uh oh, <laughs> oh, it's so yeah. good. Now there was a question difficult to answer. A thousand thoughts collided in my head at once. The lady patience, my father's wife, and by many accounts, the one most responsible for my father's withdrawal from the court and from me. A little bit of blame and resentment for yeah, directed at lady patience for pulling his father away from him. Mm -hmm. And then it says, that was the one who I had been chatting with in the kitchen and drunkenly saluting. That was who had quizzed me this morning on my education. To Birik, I muttered, not formally, but we've met. (laughs) (laughs) And Birik just laughs. Right. Oh, he's not even a little bit surprised (laughs) because of course she wouldn't introduce herself to him. She'd just expect him to know. And he goes on to say, like, yeah, I can tell she hasn't changed much just, just by your reaction and tells her or uh, tells Fitz, excuse me, the story of how they met. And it's so cute. It's oh, she was sitting up in a tree and demanded that he removed a splinter from her foot and took off her stocking and shoe gasp in front of him. And they didn't even know each other. Yeah. And Birk was probably 15 or 16 or something like that. Yeah. And that was a few years even before she met Chivalry. So they had fallen in, in love for, you know, a little bit, had a split, and then was introduced to Chivalry and yeah. met again. <laughs> yeah. Different sides. Poor Birk being part of two love triangles. I know. <laughs> <laughs> with the people he loves oh yeah my heart um but and he she did. had a wretched little dog yes. is that what you're gonna say <laughs> i was Sorry. just gonna say that it's funny that he's talking about the first time they met and then immediately talks about the animal that she had <laughs> it was always wheezing and retching up wads of its own fur its name was feather duster he paused for a moment and smiled almost fondly what a thing to remember after all these years did she like you when you fir- when she first met you? I asked tactlessly. And that kind of brings him back to reality because, yeah, they liked each other a lot when they first met. Yeah. And he's like, better than she does now. Oh, poor Burek. But that's of small import. Let's hear it, Fitz. What does she think of you? I feel so bad because it is like, you know, he obviously thinks very fondly of her still. Um... But it would be really hard to know because I don't think he ever truly gets over her. I mean, maybe once he gets with I Molly. Think, I think he does. Um, I think like I think there's a part where Molly and him and this might be when Fitz is like looking in on one of their conversations. 
um, with the skill later on. Mm-hmm. I think there's a part where they're talking and Molly asks him about patience and beer, like them two as yeah in love when they were kids. And I think Birik says something along the lines of, uh, I love her as she was and as I was, but right. like I've kind of moved past that. Hmm. So like you can look back fondly on those memories and like, yes, we were in love together, but now like we're in different places kind of thing. I guess. And obviously she doesn't like him. So yeah. like he kind of just, that's... That's what that's who he is. He just takes it in stride and like that's that's what it is. It's not important yeah. anymore. What I'm not gonna you, try Fitz? to make it better. I'm not <laughs> Yep. So if it's uh trying to tell the uh the truth without putting in the details that he was, you know, drunk and things like that. Mm-hmm. Tells Birik first. He doesn't then, want to get in trouble. He yeah. doesn't want Birik to be disappointed in him. And then Birik's like, no, retell it fully. And Fitz retells it fully. Yeah. I actually really love when he, how he tells Fitz to tell it fully. Um, he stops him and says, when you cut pieces out of the truth to avoid looking like a fool, you end up sounding like a moron instead. Let's start again. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good lesson. Yeah. Just tell the whole truth. It'll be better than looking like an idiot. And he, after hearing the story, Birk is like, well, you have a way of presenting yourself to the people that you should most likely avoid at all times. Yep. (laughs) Which is a little allusion back to uh, Fitz popping up right in front of Shrewd. Yep. (laughs) Starting off the whole, you know. Learning how to be a soldier and learning to be an assassin. Exactly. And uh, Birik then changes the topic to talk about the dogs. And I think they're the same dogs that Fitz was talking to Molly about in, in their little, like, picnic thing. Mm-hmm. And Fitz is so proud. Yeah, he's very proud because I guess she has a history of um, bad births. Yeah. And he's like, and all survived, I said proudly. And the next line... Beric is replies to himself. Let's just hope we do as well for ourselves. Yeah. Do you think he's scared of Lady Patience? Yes, I do. <laughs> I think not necessarily of physical harm to himself or anything. That's fair because he's like a giant man yes. and she's so small. But he is scared because he knows what she can do and what kind of trouble she can cause for like the status quo. <laughs> That's fair. So he's like, okay, you introduced yourself to Lady Patience who doesn't care about any sorts of propriety mm-hmm. or like way of doing things that are traditional. Um, let's see what you got yourself into, and I hope we all survive. <laughs> I do want to say I think it's odd that the two of them had a thing for a little bit. I just, because Burek is so, everything has to be a certain way because that's the way of things. I'm not going to question the status quo. And patience is so, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and you can either do it too or not. And so that's why I it's... Think... I don't know. It's just a very interesting coupling. I think it's the same way that chivalry and patience were together. Chivalry is described the same way that Beric is, and I think a lot of Beric's manners and his moral compass came from chivalry because Mm -hmm. Beric was... I think think the story goes they met because Beric got into a fight with another soldier in chivalry's camp, basically, Mm -hmm. and chivalry brought him in and they met, and I think, like, Beric while he was on his way to becoming an okay person, really got taken under chivalry's wing of how to be a man. And I think that's like, Beric is the best reflection of how chivalry would act in situations Mm -hmm. without chivalry's like careful uh, insistence about being tactful and diplomatic and his way with people. Mm-hmm. But Beric is like the the straight guidelines that Chivalry lived his life by, without okay. the being you know, yeah, <laughs> without the softening of the edges <laughs> that Chivalry probably had. So that's fair. the same way that Chivalry and Patience were together, that's probably kind of what attracted the two of them, Beric and uh, and Patience. Yeah, I guess that'd be my thoughts on it, anyways, because we don't really we don't get a look into how Beric was back then. Right. 
We know how Patience was based on different <laughs> descriptions and stories, but yeah, we only get a couple glimpses into Birik, and they're the bigger things that happen, like his childhood and like what led him to be introduced to chivalry, but we don't see like the day-to-day. Right, right. Good point. Well, the next person to admonish fits for being seen by Lady Patience is Jade. Yeah, speaking of how them being so alike is, you know, kind of <laughs> weird to Fitz, literally the first line, and I'm sure Robin Hobb did this, like, deliberately, is, mm-hmm. I'd have thought you'd have good sense to avoid her. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Fitz, you know, defends himself. that she He didn't know that that's who she was. And we, we see here that uh, this is his first lesson in two months with Jade. And he's been without Beric for the past month as well. Mm-hmm. And I, as much as all of this needed to happen for the story to go the right way, without Chade and Beric influence there, Fitz was incredibly happy just doing his job and then going yeah. to town and hanging out with friends and then getting a little tipsy and coming back. He was just living life as a kid. Yeah. He- so it's kind of sad to see like, The difference between the two, even if it's only a small glimpse. Yeah, that is a little sad. (laughs) Um, I guess I did want to ask, though, so what do you think Shade was doing for the past two months? I'm not exactly sure, but I'm, uh, at least on the specifics, but I'm almost 100% sure it had to do with the forgings and the potential potential war i guess they would be discussing because it's such a danger to their whole you know society and the six duchies as a as a whole yeah. so i'm I'm sure it had to do with mitigating that or you know maybe him traveling to all the different towns that got hit and talking to people at those places because i mean two months is a long time yeah you can travel uh a long ways in that period of time and, and talk to a lot of different people. Yeah. Because he's, he's the king's man. He, he yeah. was sent out probably to gather information. That's his job. I guess I just assumed he was killing the forged people. He was doing that so that Fitz wouldn't have to. Um, but I guess Fitz does get sent out in a little bit to do that. So maybe he wasn't. Yeah, I think... Or maybe he was trying to see if there's any way to get them to turn back. That could be. He could have been, like, you know, trying different things. I don't know if he could have been killing a couple of them, but I think Fitz was mostly sent out because, like the um, rumor that Molly brought up, they did be- start banding together during winter. Mm-hmm. And it was becoming an issue for travel during winter. So I think that's why... Fitz was sent out because they were becoming larger and larger bands of forged ones. Hmm. And right now during like, you know, late summer or whatever it is, I don't know if that was the biggest issue confronting them. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. He just seems so weary and his room is described as very cold, um, which it isn't normally. So I was just wondering if maybe that's because he hadn't been in it for two months. Um, But I guess he could have just been gathering data, not, you know, killing. So, I don't know. He was very talkative that night as well, Mm -hmm. probably because, you know, he was been alone for two months or whatever. Um, And that's another point. I think I, we talked about it a couple episodes ago or last episode where there's a few times where, one of the people that he's around starts talking a lot and they don't know that they're talking a lot. And that happened literally the last paragraph as well with Beric talking about patience. Yep. <laughs> and now it's happening with Jade talking about the Royal family and Fitz is just like too scared to talk or like interrupt <laughs> their thoughts uh-huh. because he's, uh, he doesn't want that to stop really. He just wants to know more. Yeah. He's talking about patience here. And he keeps, like, talking about how chivalry 
was always so correct. And he thinks that chivalry saw something in patience that he instinctively knew that he needed. Mm -hmm. Since chivalry was so correct, he was, according to Chade, always chivalrous in the best sense of that word. He did not give in to ugly or petty impulses, and that meant he exuded a certain air of restraint at all times. <clears throat> so those that did not know him well thought him cold or cavalier. And then he met Patience, who was pretty much the exact opposite, and I think chivalry gravitated to that. Yeah. She's described as... Uh, no more substance to her than to cobwebs and sea foam. Thoughts and tongue always flying from this to that. Nitterdy natterdy. With never a pause or connection I could see. It used to exhaust me just to listen to her. <laughs> but chivalry would smile and marvel. Perhaps it was that she didn't seem particularly eager to win him. But with a score of more eligible ladies, of better birth and brighter brains pursuing him, he chose patience. And it wasn't even timely for him to wed. When he took her to wife, he shut the gate on a dozen possible alliances that a wife could have brought him. There was no good reason for him to get married at that time, not one. And then Fitz comes in with, not except that he wanted to. Right. He has that little romantic streak like in his head now that like, my father married who he wanted, when he wanted, because he loved her. Mm -hmm. Shade seems really... Oh, rude. <laughs> In his description <laughs> of patience. Um, do you think he hates her? I don't think so at all. I think... Um, personally, I think that... As someone who likes chivalry and looked at him kind of like, as as an uncle, as he was, mm -hmm. he loved patience for him because she would make him smile. She kind of brought these, you know, this life into his restrained world. Mm -hmm. But as someone who was looking out for the kingdom, she was the worst choice he could have made out of even, you know, a dozen other people. Right. And it didn't do anything to help secure the kingdom. It didn't do anything to help, you know, prevent future issues. Chivalry made a mistake in his eyes as an advisor for the king. Yeah, that's fair. I guess he's just so rude about how he's describing her. that I'm like, man, it really seems like he hates her, but he doesn't at the same time. And well, I guess he just doesn't have a filter. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have a filter one. And it's a an old man talking about how a young girl would flip from this topic to this topic. Right. And I could see no connections, no logical connections between <laughs> anything she spoke about. But chivalry <laughs> smiled, so it was fine. <laughs> also, old I, man discussing and complaining about the youth of the days. Uh -huh. And I love that he... It's like, it annoyed me to hear her talk as though his little weird ramblings aren't <laughs> annoying right, for other people. Right. <laughs> Does that mean that she met him and knew who he was? Um, I think so, but I actually don't know. I thought there was some textual evidence somewhere that they knew each other, but I, I, I don't remember at all. I mean, she was going to be queen. She right. was queen in waiting, right? So... I it wouldn't surprise it me. It wouldn't to surprise know. me if Chivalry like introduced them because he liked Jade so much. Right. And also, if they didn't, Jade would have heard them in the walls. True. And heard her speak and probably had to vet her and like <laughs> investigate her. Fair. Um, but he also mentions in this passage that um this was the first major disappointment that Chivalry dealt his father. Um, and then nothing he did after ever completely pleased Shrewd. Um, why do you think Shrewd is so disappointed in this marriage? Just because of the lack of political alliance? I think so, yeah. Alliance? Because Shrewd is Shrewd, and he would calculate pretty much everything. I mean, he he married his first wife for an alliance to secure, you know, more power and stability. And I think he was expecting Chivalry to do the same thing because Chivalry was 
smart and Mm -hmm. knew that process and knew what he was getting into and then just kind of like hey i like her more though do you think this is the chink in the armor that allows regal and his mother to slip in maybe because it does say that shrewd never really was pleased 100 percent with anything that chivalry did after that Mm -hmm. so it could have been like a little like a lowering of chivalry in shrewd's eyes and then regals this young boy's like i can raise this one to be correct though Hmm. i don't know i don't know either so i guess what we're saying is it's all patient's fault (laughs) no (laughs) don't you dare put that on her (laughs) uh jade then kind of um continues that fitz made a big impression on her she wasn't hearing that Fitz was being treated like a prince, like she thought he ought to be, and demanded that he be recognized as a prince and educated as one. And Fitz has a little line in here that says, I was dizzied. Did the wall tapestries move for me, or was it a trick of my eyes? Chade kind of crashes that whatever he had right there, and he said, oh, of course that could never happen. And Fitz is like, I don't even know what I was feeling. What, what do you think he was feeling there? I'm not 100% sure. Um, I kind of feel like maybe he was, I don't know how quite to phrase this, but he felt like he finally had someone in his corner for the first time. Because, I mean, Shade and Burek, they both love him and they both want what's best for him, but they both constantly remind him that he is just a bastard and that he should not be aspiring for more he should not want more than what he's given he should be grateful for what's happening in his life and this woman who has known him for less than a few days and has only seen him at his worst has demanded that he be recognized as royalty and that he get the same treatment as other royal people and maybe it's just a little bit of surprise maybe it's like excitement of some sort just because this person is there for him they want him to be more yeah i also think it's partially because he's in a weird spot right now he's not a stable boy he's not an even a noble Mm -hmm. he doesn't really have a place he's in between everything and if he was recognized and made to be a prince I think, like, in his mind, that's equating with, like, belonging to his family. Right. Because he doesn't even have a name. (laughs) Yeah. Like, so, I think, like, I definitely like what you said. I think that combining with, like, someone believes in me and I would have a place to belong and, like, be part of something. Mm Mm-hmm. It's kind of, like, what hits him in between the eyes and then he kind of, like, gets crushed immediately. (laughs) Yeah, of course, of course, Jade is like oblivious. He's, yeah, he's like, of course, like, of course, he turned it down. And poor Fitz is like embarrassed that he felt anything towards the idea of him becoming a prince. And I just felt so bad for him in that moment because he shouldn't feel embarrassed. And it's not that weird. I mean, he is a, uh, in that awkward stage of life, so everything feels weird and embarrassing. But. <laughs> But I do feel bad for him because he should have more people in his corner, like patients. There should yeah. these people who love him should be able to support him. I understand why they can't and like what's keeping them from doing that fully, but it's still it's kind of sad to realize that this woman who has barely known him at all is more team fits than his father figures. Right. And she uh doesn't really take no for an answer. No. Um, to the king. She the king. is just... <laughs> Literally sitting in front of the king with the king in waiting and a prince there demands that this young boy be recognized as the heir to the throne to be the next king in front of both of them and is like, no, just do it. I don't care if it's impossible. Teach him stuff. You'll see what happens when he's older and it'll be mm-hmm. good. Uh huh. You'll know. If you just even give him the training, you'll know that it was worth it. And, uh. Jade says, uh, Verity listened quietly, knowing how it must end, and 
Regal was livid. He becomes overwrought far too easily. Even an idiot should know Shrewd could not accede to patient's demand, but he knows when to compromise. In all else, he gave way to her mostly, I think, to stop her tongue. <laughs> Which is very funny, but also love that Jade is calling Regal an idiot here. Like, Yeah, he just becomes, yeah, it's true though, he becomes overwrought far too easily. He just becomes irate and angry at literally anything that might go the wrong way for him. Right. Which is so childish and weird because what would it matter? I mean, even if Fitz was recognized at this point, Verity is the king in waiting, right? So it wouldn't, he wouldn't be next in line, I guess, unless Verity didn't have a kid, but it's not like Verity would suddenly stop being king in waiting and it would go to Fitz, right? Right. So, but that's what, she's demanding mm. if she's demanding him be recognized as a prince and if shrewd recognizes Fitz as chivalry's heir then the throne falls to Fitz but, because it's chivalry's heir but chivalry abdicated the throne so wouldn't that negate his line i don't think so because it's the firstborn and then the firstborn like once they're done then it's their kids mm. unless there's no kids so I think technically it would fall to Fitz. And that's why, like he mentions before, um, that Shrewd explained, like, the nobles would never accept him. It would mean civil war. Okay. Because some of them would be like, yeah, we love chivalry, chivalry, yes. And some would be like, this kid is a bastard. We have Verity. Why? And the people would be fighting over it. And even accepting him, even if it doesn't doesn't mean that Fitz would be next in line and Verity would still be first, then where does Fitz fall? Where where is Fitz in there? He's mm. still that in between, and it would be very confusing, I think, to everybody else. That's a good point. And I guess Verity isn't super well liked right now, so that really might cause the civil war of like, well, chivalry was way better, so maybe his son would be right like a better choice. I get it. Okay. This is just the hard stuff of, like, not growing up in a monarchy. We don't... Right, right. right. <laughs> I don't understand how it works. <laughs> and since it's a fantasy monarchy, not all the rules are the same. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> but um, Jade is pretty happy and slightly annoyed that some things, you know, worked out the way they did. Mm-hmm. But uh, Patience got most of her way. Yeah. But she took on, like, all the responsibility. <laughs> yeah. So he gets to uh, learn a bunch of stuff now. And Shade's like, you better find more time in the day because I'm not giving up any of my time with you. Ooh. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy for him to be able to get the opportunity to learn yeah. more. She has vowed to undertake such educating herself. Music, poetry, dance, song, manners. I hope you have a better tolerance for it than I did. So it never seemed to hurt chivalry. And this is, you know, another another hint uh-huh. before we get to the revelation that, you know, <laughs> Jade grew up in court. Uh-huh. He learned all these things. He had teachers that taught him how to be, you know, how to sing, dance, do music, learn manners. If Jade had to learn all these things, does that mean he was acknowledged or not? Because... I think it's kind of the same gray-ish area as Fitz, but he was more prominently in the court because he was raised with... He he came to court when he was like 10, I Mm -hmm. think. So he was more like, oh, instead of six, like the six-year-old can't start learning these things yet, so we'll just put him to Birik to raise him for a while. And then it was just kind of forgotten about. I think he was like, this is a 10-year-old. We can start teaching him these things. And then I then he kind of like, you know, disappeared after his accident. And Mm. I don't think he was ever formally acknowledged or put into like the line ever. But he was brought onto the team knowing that he would be a diplomat slash assassin. Right. It just feels weird to like have rules about things that are different from generation to generation. Yeah. Two different kings. Yeah. They're running their stuff differently, I guess. I guess there's more turmoil, and yeah. there was only King Shrewd, right? He didn't have any other siblings, so... Yeah, not as not as far as I know. Hmm. Maybe maybe it's 
something that true changed because uh of the way that Shade was in the court. Maybe there was confusion between the two of them because wow, this older half brother is, you know, he's pretty well educated. He's, mm-hmm. you know, vain and, you know, looks <laughs> regal and he's right. kingly. Huh. Maybe that there is like issues with that and Shude's like I I don't want to create any more issues with my court fair enough so Fitz will be a little bit more out of the light so they're talking about yeah how he's gonna have to find more time in the day yep yep um and he's gonna have to give up weapons training and time with Burek Mm -hmm. stable training um and he's like I don't care about the weapons training because I'm going to be an assassin, so I'm not going to have to use a sword. Um, but his time with Burek is different. And he says, again, I had the odd sensation of not knowing how I felt. I hated Burek. Sometimes. He was overbearing, dictatorial, and insensitive. He expected me to be perfect, yet bluntly told me that I would never be rewarded for it. But he was also open and blunt and believed I could achieve what he demanded. And I think this is a really good insight as to how he feels about their relationship and what's going on there and why he's feeling so angsty. I love the I hate my dad, kind of. I don't I don't actually hate him, but I hate my dad. <laughs> but it just really points out that the people in his life are expecting him to be okay with this lot in life that he doesn't get to choose and they're a little bit hard on him yeah definitely very demanding and um chade kind of breezes past all of that because he's like oh yeah you're, you're gonna learn all this make time in the day for it whatever but the real thing that she won for us Mm-hmm. Is that you're going to learn the skill. Yeah. He's very focused on the us there. Yeah. Because he has desperately wanted the ability to skill. He want he wants to feel a part of the family as well. Right. The Farseer heritage. He mm-hmm. feels that's part of, partly his because he is a Farseer. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of drops that bomb on Fitz and Fitz is like, I, okay. <laughs> yeah, I've heard about it like three times ever in my life. Yeah, he's like, okay, cool, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> oh. And he uh, kind of recites to Chade like what he knows about it, basically. Um, and in his mind, he's remembering how the wit feels to him, mm-hmm. and how Burek reacted to the wit, and he's worried that the skill might interfere with the wit Mm -hmm. or take any of that away. They might not work together. He's just kind of like, what's going to happen to me with the sense that I'm just discovering. Yeah. And, Oh, this part was really sad to read for me. Um, when he says, I remembered nosy and a mingling of warmth and grief. I had never been so close before or since to another living creature. Would this new training and the skill take that away from me? And it just, ugh. Yeah. He's so lonely. And this is the only thing that makes him feel not alone because he can literally feel others. Mm -hmm. And it gives him a sort of comfort. He relies on it so much. Yeah. And he's literally blind to a group of people without the wits. Yeah, true. (laughs) Oh, so it just, I don't know. That just, that just really broke my heart because it's, He's so lonely and it's so sad. I don't know. I just. Chade is kind of worried about him because he, he zones out and he doesn't look super excited as Chade feels. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what's the matter, boy? Chade's voice was kindly but concerned. I don't know. I hesitated. But not even to Chade could I dare to reveal my fear or my taint. Nothing, I guess. He's feeling the same way that Birk has been telling him all the time, that yeah. the wit is a taint. It's it's not good. It's something terrible. So it's really sad that, that, that Fitz he, is starting to think like that. Yeah. Yeah. That he think it's he thinks the wit is such a bad thing. But 
he also is like, I, I don't really care. At the same time, I'm going to keep using it as long as Beard yeah. doesn't know. I just don't want the skill to interfere with that. And Shade's like, oh, you, you've you heard about the, the skill training. It can't be as bad as the stories. Like, yeah. Which, it'll be what, fine. What are the stories? What kind of <laughs> what kind of myths would be that concerning to a child? I think because when they get the skill scrolls back, uh, there's two ways to open up your mind to the skill. Mm-hmm. And one is, you know, meditation, accepting it. And one is what Galen does. And that's yeah. like the austere lifestyle barely eating anything Mm -hmm. um i don't think beatings are a part of it but like any of that shade could be like oh it's you know it's it can't be as bad as like the the terrible lifestyles they tell you yeah i don't know there's probably since they don't have any of that knowledge there's probably some bad rumors circulating about what it is and um he kind of continues on. He's like, oh, yeah, Galen is going to be teaching you. Um, he's not enthused about it, but I sus- suspect it's a very good idea for you to get it. Training. Mm-hmm. He says that Shrewd wants a coterie or two. He's kind of lifted that ban on, on training people. Um, so. Yeah. Do you think this coterie is Regal's idea? Um... It could be, but personally, I don't think that Regal has that kind of foresight. Okay. I think he's more reactionary of like, oh, these people are getting trained. Galen's doing it. Let's take this okay. for our own kind of thing. Yeah. I think Shrewd is still like, we need everything that we can get. Okay. Yeah. Well, especially because right now it's just him and uh, him Verity. And Verity, yeah. Galen's not going to do anything. No. <laughs> um, I wonder how Shrewd looks down on Verity and Galen. Because Shrewd was trained by Solicity, like the actual mm-hmm. last skill master. Yeah. So he has, you know, a very, very good control over his abilities. And I'm sure he's talked to Verity before and Chivalry with the skill and like they're always described as like raging into your mind like a, mm-hmm. a wave or a bull or something and then leaving and it's gone were they not also trained by partially they were only partially trained before she died and galen took over their training okay so they were never like even even as galen was only partially trained mm-hmm. he was trained longer than they had been so i'm sure it's just the very beginning of like how to open your mind to the skill by her basically Right. Hmm. Because they they do it very easily and they say it's it was never like, you know, austere lifestyle that Galen was teaching mm-hmm. the kids. It was very always said like, yeah, it was just like, you know, staring into a fire kind of thing and meditating. Yeah. Hmm. But I wonder if he like if Shrew's just like, Wow, these these children don't know how to use their abilities at all. Yeah, but why wouldn't he then blame Galen for that and try to have somebody else read the scrolls and train i have no idea there's blind sides to everything yeah that's fair queen probably told him to stay out of his out of the skill master's business i guess since it was you know her son Ugh, i know but um shade then kind of drops the bomb he's like Though, being a bastard myself, I was never allowed the training, so I have no real idea how this skill might be employed to defend the land. And Fitz is, like, completely blindsided for some reason, even though there's, like, right. ten hints a chapter that we always point out. Uh-huh. And he's like, you're a bastard? <laughs> <laughs> Shade stared at me as shocked at my words as I was by his. Of course. I thought you'd figured out that long ago. Boy, for someone as perceptive as you are, you've got some very odd blind spots. Truth. Yes. He is, like, so shocked. Weirdly shocked. Like, I, he just assumed it was this old man? Yeah. Like... I think it's because of his wit. He relies on it so much for all of his interactions that mm-hmm. he never really looks at anybody. <laughs> okay. He, he doesn't. Like, right. he, we have examples of that. Yeah. Jade knows he's percep- perceptive because he can you know, focus his attention on things that Jade will tell him to focus on and he'll 
pick out things. He's intelligent Mm -hmm. and he has the capabilities to be, you know, observant in all ways. But since he relies on his wit so much that he's, he's never really like looked at shade. And it says that the next page, he's like, I looked at him as if I had never seen him before Mm -hmm. and I could see the resemblance in like all of his lines and everything. I, in my mind, it's because Fitz is just like so reliant on his wit sense. That he just, that just kind of like absorbs everything. (laughs) That's, that's fair. But I mean, even without looking at him, he would have, he would think he would have known (laughs) that he was at least a, like a bastard of some noble, maybe not the king if he's not going to use his eyes, but you know, just literally a bastard at all, but no, not fits. He does have some odd blind spots. And then like a a true um, sibling, Shade laughs at the idea that Fitz is like, what are you, shrewd son? And <laughs> Fitz immediately is like, oh, that's probably, that's definitely wrong. But Shade's like, <laughs> he'd be mad to hear you say that. Uh-huh. Especially because he's a younger brother. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think my older brother is my son? How old do I look? <laughs> yeah. So, uh. Um, And right here, like, we got a correction for before, literally, like, two chapters later. says, yeah, my I was conceived in a military campaign near Sand's Edge. My mother was a soldier. (laughs) (laughs) So um, this is where we know that his mother died young. Mm -hmm. He was basically given a necklace that was probably given to her by King Bounty. And then given a donkey and told to ride to Buck. Buck keep when he was 10. Yeah. By himself. Yeah. Which, what a jerk. His, his stepdad. stepdad was abusive as well. We don't learn that here, but. Oh, I totally forgot yeah. about that. Mm-hmm. Makes more sense why he would be a jerk like that then. But still, oh, I don't know. So then uh, Chade kind of like, oh, enough of that. Um, Galen's going to instruct you. He finally acceded, but with reservations. He was like saying no to shrewd at first but shrewd like ugh. yeah which he had under one condition he would do it and who is galen to tell the king no unless and also what kind of a no one is to interfere with any of his students excuse me you're talking to your king sir and he can interfere if he would like to um He's been trained in the skill the king has. He knows mm-hmm. how it works. He would know that he most definitely could interfere. So why would he even... I think he's more demanding, like, make sure no one, de- like, interferes with me. Even though Galen doesn't want to think so, I'm sure he knows that Shrewd could be, like, step in and say, hey, do this. But, like, he knows the king won't personally do that. He's like, make sure no one else gets any ideas in their head to, like, say, hey, you're doing this wrong. I guess, but it just feels like, why does Galen get so many, spe- like, why is he treated so specially? Why does he get to do whatever he wants? I wish we had a more formal definition of what the skill master's duties were and how it kind of related, because they have a very unique position of training the whole kingdom's, you know, skill users, and those yeah. are used as defense, as couriers, as like a bunch of different things in the kingdom and they all have to relate back to the king itself Mm -hmm. and be you know like linked with the royal family so the skill master has a big task and he could be pulling weight like i'm the only one who has all this knowledge and all these these scrolls and stuff i know i'm the only one who knows how to do it leave me alone but it's hard to say without knowing how much sway that position holds i mean I th- I guess when Nettle is a skill master or mistress, I saw it as kind of like a advisory role to the king, but that's because she has multiple coteries that she's in charge of. Right. This is Galen who has no one that he's right, in control right. of right now. He basically does nothing all day. He just uh, like has the title. Maybe and he's now- just upset that he has something to do now. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get to just eat alone in his room all the time. What a sad existence for a sad, sad man. All right. um, 
And Jade asks him what he knows about Galen, what Fitz knows about him. And Fitz kind of recites a bunch of things. I don't know if you want to get into specifics about it. It's basically he's just mean to um, people that are below him or he perceives are below him. He's, um, you know, kind of a loner. He eats in his room. He dresses similarly to Regal and kind of looks like him. He's a Queen's man, uh, which means that he thinks that Regal is more royal than Chivalry and Verity. Mm -hmm. And he's even gone as far to say that the Queen should have ruled instead of Shrewd because she had more farcier blood than he did, which got um, which was gossip from one of the soldiers who like took a took a punch at him and then took a whip cut to the lip. Because Galen... Why does he just have a whip on him? Who is he? Indiana Jones? Riding crop, man. He he <laughs> needs to beat people. <laughs> He's not strong enough to do it himself, so he just has to always carry a weapon. Oh, what a yeah. jerk. So, I think the story about Gage and Galen um, really paints enough of a picture for me. I mean, everything else that's talked about afterwards helps color in the picture. Yeah. But... Just knowing that he is openly saying that Desire is more royal and that Regal is more royal than his brothers is like everything I need to know about him. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's also saying that for selfish reasons, considering he's Regal's half brother. Right. An illegitimate brother. So, like, yeah, I'm. if he says and the general public accepts that Regal is more royal than Verity... He kind of has claim to that, too, a little bit. I guess. But also, if Regal's so, like, so much more noble, then how come he doesn't have any wit? Or not wit, sorry. Skill. Any skill at all. Yeah, I don't know. Well, like, doesn't it say he has very weak skill? Uh, something uh, like that. I, I don't like, remember. They have, like, a parasitic relationship with him and Will um, later on. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember, like, if... He was granted that ability to like speak in there or Mm -hmm. if he had a small ability of his own and they like linked together. Right. I don't remember which one was which. I just like they always talk about how he's so much more of noble birth and obviously Desire has two farseer bloodlines and like, okay, well, if that's the case, then why do neither of you have any ounce of skill? Like, how are you going to sit there and claim that you're more royal than the three royals that actually have the royal skill right i just don't and people are just chill with the fact that he doesn't have that like (laughs) (laughs) they're like oh sure the one son that doesn't have any sort of magical ability he's the one we want to rule us what (laughs) and i think like the skill in the whole lifetime of regal pretty much has been hushed up and talked about only as like oh and maybe the king can read my mind because he has this mysterious magic so Mm -hmm. i I don't think people like think of it very often i guess and then the red ship raiders they like because during the red ship raiders when verity is like wasting away they they don't understand what he's doing right and they're like he's doing nothing so yeah i think just the general information is not not there not up to snuff yeah that's fair i guess it just, I don't know. It feels to me like that's a big chink in the armor if you yeah. could just work it a little bit. But I guess if it nobody really knows about the skill, because it's so hush hush. Right. I don't know. I just don't like either of them. Oh, no. Yeah, me either. But um, with Fitz mentioning that they, that Galen and Regal even kind of look alike sometimes, Shade's like, they do? Oh. <laughs> What else have you noticed? And like it's like an open secret at this point, uh-huh. but not but also everybody knows. Fitzy literally just got told <laughs> that Shade was a bastard, and he was like, "Oh, you didn't notice?" And now he's like, "Oh, they look alike, huh?" Yeah, tell me what more else? about that. What like, else? read the room, my guy. What? Why? Does he just, do you think he just has a complex of like, I'm the only one who gets me. I'm the only bastard. So he just doesn't look outside to see who else is maybe dealing with that. Right. I, who knows? Oh, Fitz. <laughs> um, he also mentions that Bjork doesn't like him, but he respects him because he gets his job done. 
who knows what his actual job is, but right. um, he also can never like a man who mistreats animals. Yeah, because he's a jerk to horses. Yeah. He ruins he's, horses. He's too hard on the on the bit, so it like ruins their mouth, basically. And their temperament. Yeah. Like, what kind of monster doesn't learn just learn how to ride a horse? I mean, I don't know how to ride a horse, but <laughs> but I don't have to regularly ride a horse in my day to day life. So Right. If I did, I would try not to ruin every horse I rode. Ugh. I don't know. And then uh he kind of continuing the talk about Galen kind of uh asks him, like, you know, has he ever talk to you um and Fitz is like no uh, but he can't be that bad basically like I've had harsh teachers in the past and Jade's like well you better get used to him because he hates you like he absolutely hates you to the highest degree that unnerves me Mm -hmm. and it's even worse than what he felt for your father which was like way too creepy for me too and that's because Shade doesn't understand the skill and what happened um i read up a little bit on it i haven't i didn't find the place in the book where it's mentioned but we know that chivalry accidentally skilled and commanded galen to have loyalty for him mm-hmm. like an undying loyalty that really ruined anything that galen could feel towards fitz Galen couldn't blame chivalry for his own death. Even Mm -hmm. he couldn't blame him for anything. So he shifted all of that anger, all of that blame over to Fitz. And now just like, it's pretty much skilled into him that Fitz is at fault for the person that I was loyal to for him dying. Basically. Yeah. It's a rough situation and it, it frightens Jade, which is scary. Yeah. Yeah. And also the fact that he's, telling Fitz in this serious way of hey this guy hates you this isn't just one of his like slip of the tongue no filter and he hates you this is a he hates you and I'm worried that he might try to do something because of it and he refused to teach Fitz to shrewd and he like told shrewd of his hatred basically yeah which also again uh that's his grandson bud so maybe don't tell the king that you hate somebody. Mm. I don't know. Just just a thought. Shrewd's making him, though. So, whatever. Um, <sighs> but in that conversation where they're talking about Galen, um, Fitz is reciting everything that he knows about him, and he kind of says, the fool hates him. Mm-hmm. And Shade's like, what? 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 The fool talks to you? Yeah. <laughs> And Fitz is like, yeah, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> it's uh, <sighs> not very often. No. Only when he feels like it, he just appears and tells me things. Jade's brows sh- went up. His tone was more than incredulous. He sat up in his chair so suddenly that his wine leaped out of his cup and splashed on his sleeve. And he wasn't even like focused on the. He just kind of like rubbed at the stain a little bit, but was like focused on this conversation. It's so incredulous to him that, like, the fool would choose to talk to any anybody besides Shrewd. hmm And he's very interested in what he has to say. He's like, things. Like, like what things? Yeah. What are you saying? And Fitz never tells him about the Fitz Fats, Fitz Riddle. Right. Because it's too complicated and yeah. eh, it doesn't blah, really blah, blah. make a ton of sense. All right, Fitz. <laughs> Um, and he's like, oh, just odd things. Like he, he stopped me and told me that tomorrow was a bad hunt to go on. And that was the day that was really nice outside and we caught everything. Like we did everything that we wanted to do. And Shade's like, wasn't that when the Wolverine came and like tore up some dogs and almost got you? (laughs) And Fitz is like, yeah, but it didn't. Beric wrote him down. And Shade's like, hmm, hmm, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Do you think Beric knows or sorry, Chade knows that the fool is a prophet or like suspects. I, I think so. Um, he's had conversations with Shrewd and I'm sure the fool has been in the room with him because I know they, they know of each other. Right. 
um, the Fool and Shade do. So I think they've been in the room at the same time and have kind of discussed like where the Fool came from, Mm -hmm. like what he's doing there, um, and potentially what he could provide for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I'm sh- I like have this picture in my mind of, um, of Chade going in and grabbing all of the scrolls he possibly can on people of that skin color, mm-hmm. people who um, came from way, 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 way south, uh-huh. people who uh, have prophecies or anything like that, and kind of came upon the whites and their prophecies, but set yeah. it aside and dismissed it, thinking that the fool would have been just a little bit out there and like a little bit crazy or something and just a normal, um, well, abnormal child or kid or something like that. And then hearing this, he's like, wait, (laughs) wait, is the whites and their prophets and catalysts a real thing? Mm -hmm. And we do know that, um, the fool did tell shrewd about Fitz, um, and wanted to make sure Fitz was protected. Yeah. So I'm sure Shade knows about that. Yeah. So. Like there's the little hints leading up. And it says, like, um, speaking of that, like, hunt day, Shade says, as I recall, it nearly got you. He leaned forward, an oddly pleased look on his face. He's just getting confirmation in uh-huh. his brain right now, I think. Just more little thoughts of, like, there's some connection here. And he chose Fitz, my my Fitzy boy, my <laughs> apprentice, to speak to. Because mm-hmm. I think Shade is is realizing that, one, he truly does care for Shrewd as much as Shade cares for Shrewd. Right. And two, that he, that the fool is intelligent and will only speak to people who, like, he needs to. Mm-hmm. And hearing that the fool spoke to Fitz that kind of like assigns some relevance to Fitz that Chade is just knows that he's on the right track basically. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it would be kind of interesting to like know that this person who doesn't talk to anybody is talking to like, like you said, talking to the person that you trained. So that must mean something good. Um, I'm sure Shade has like spied on him before. mm -hmm. Like, He's an extremely secretive person, but I mean, I'm sure Chade right. has tried to figure out everything he possibly can about the fool and to find out somebody who literally doesn't talk to anybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's kind of a crazy, crazy thing to learn. Yeah. But then uh, it kind of takes a little bit of a turn because Fitz is going off on a tangent a little bit um, about how about the fool saying, Jade, I know the fool is strange. But I like it when he comes to talk to me. He speaks in riddles, and he insults me, and makes fun of me, and gives himself leave to tell me things he thinks I should do, like wash my hair, or not wear yellow. And I just want to say that it's so funny that the fool is like, test in the very beginning of their friendship, telling him what to wear and how to look. Yeah. And <laughs> oh, I just love that. It just never goes away. But it is a little sad that we don't get to see or read rather any of these experiences firsthand that we have to wait until he's telling Jade about it because they don't seem that important to him, but they do seem important because then he continues on to say, "I like him." I said lamely. He mocks me, but from him it seems a kindness. He makes me feel well, important that he could choose me to talk to and so obviously this friendship is super important so why hasn't he talked about it before now he's talking about molly and their little weird relationship going on but why is he keeping the fool secret from this telling of his story i'm not really sure um maybe it's robin hobb just creating that sense of drama in there (laughs) Just for narrative reasons. Maybe it's because the fool wasn't like a fully realized character until like her revisions or like after her first draft. Maybe, I don't know. I, it's hard to tell. Maybe it was something that he felt he wanted to keep to himself because it was so important to himself. Yeah. 
I guess I like to think, I mean, I know that the fool wasn't originally going to be an important character, but I like to think that by him not admitting until now that the fool was important to him, um, it's something that he's keeping for himself. And even in this telling of his past to the reader, he's not giving everything away. And like some things are too precious and that he holds too dear to just... Would you say some things are too beloved to (laughs) give (laughs) Yes, I think that is a great word. (laughs) Chade then says, trust your instincts. Keep any counsel the fool gives you, and as you have, keep it private that he comes and speaks to you. Some could take it amiss. And then Chade says it's king shrewd perhaps after all his, the fool is his bought and paid for mm-hmm. first question why is he trying to hide his smile i'm not sure um it could be that like fitz is just like describing a friend basically yeah <laughs> and shade's like okay, he this doesn't know cute. yeah this yeah. is kind of cute but um i'm not sure if it's something else more than that okay Second question, is this a mistake in the writing, or is this what Shrewd told Shade so that he wouldn't get too suspicious of this little boy? Yeah, I'm not sure. The bought and paid for, you mean? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It could be what the fool told told Shrewd. Remember, he came with the letter that said he was a gift. Right. Right. The paid for part, I don't understand. Like the, the like the bought and paid for, but it could be like, this is you know a gift from the satrap to Buck. What if I just thought of this? What if bought and paid for in terms of loyalty? Definitely could be true. Because that's kind of how they talk about Fitz's loyalty to the king. Yeah. How 100%. they bought his loyalty. I actually like that a lot. Like, when Fitz, in the first chapters, they talk about Fitz's loyalty, it's talking about how he bought Fitz's loyalty by giving him a place to sleep in the castle and clothes and shelter. And so, maybe the fool, because he has a safe place to stay, he gets to stay directly in the room of the king. Uh, yeah, no, I, I like that a lot. And it fits really well with the rest of the narrative because mm-hmm. um, the line says, after all, the fool is his. And Shrewd likes to think of everybody as game pieces, basically. Right. We've, we've said this before. Shade does too, but... Mm-hmm. Not um, to the extent, Not to the extent, right. Um, and... Chade and Fitz are also the kings. They are his. They are his pawns to do with and use as he likes. Mm -hmm. The fool is another tool in that arsenal. The fool has extremely good insights into people. He has uh, amazing observational skills and and can connect logic together about, you know, different people. I think next chapter he talks about Lady Patience briefly Mm -hmm. and there, there is just a lot of observational information that the fool can give to Shrewd that is invaluable. And that if Shrewd knows he's talking to Fitz, he could be upset because that, that is his tool. Right. He doesn't want the fool to feel any loyalty or friendship with anybody else, really. Okay. So I, I, like, your, I like your thought on that. Thank you. <laughs> of course, Fitz gets a lot more questions. Then he got answers, and mm-hmm. Shade's like, um, no, not right now. It's not like me to tell secrets on my own. If the fool wants you to know more, he can speak for himself. So he told Fitz much more than he needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the Hagrid moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Should not have said that. They continue talking about their lessons and where they're going to take place. Patience has him for a whole month before he starts the skill lessons. And there is the tower top, the Queen's Garden. Right. Um, so right before this, when they're talking about what happened when Shrewd basically 
said Galen has to teach oh, Fitz. Right. Yep. Um, Galen says, does not the bastard have to learn his place? Does not he have to be content with what you have decreed for him? Then he refused to teach you. Why doesn't he feel the same way about himself then? Because the king decreed him to be the skill master. <laughs> he, it's, he has such a rational hatred for Fitz that I don't think like we can try to ascribe reason to it because it is skill driven. Yeah. But do you think he hates himself for being a bastard? Like... Probably. Self-hatred, you know, is yeah. you know, probably fairly common. Regal's too pompous and arrogant for that, but Galen probably. I mean, he was probably told all of his life that you have royal blood in you, you know, yeah. act like it. Having Queen Desire as a mother cannot be good right. in general. But then you have um, Regal as your your half-brother, and he has two lines of royalty in him. He is so much more royal than anybody else, and you as the brother, the older brother, is probably like, oh, yay, great. I hate myself. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. So he probably doesn't just doesn't want to acknowledge, and since it's a secret anyways that he is a bastard, mm -hmm. he probably just doesn't want to acknowledge anything that might be relating to that. I guess. Jade kind of finishes it up and says that you have to be careful up there on the in the queen's garden because I have no eyes and I have no power there at all. For within the walls of the garden, I have no influence. I am blind there. It was a strange warning and one I took to heart. Yeah. He took it to heart, but he like still... <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I know. Ugh. It fits. But, yeah, it's definitely scary to know that Shade is that worried. Yeah. That he's giving warnings and telling Fitz about things that happened when he wasn't around. How do you think Fitz is feeling right now? Think he's excited for the skill lessons? No. No, because he's worried that it'll take away the wit, which True. he doesn't want. Um, I think... I think he's just super nervous overall. Yes. One yeah. for the skill, two for Lady Patience, who he like did not get introduced to very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I would say anxious is a good mood for him. This, I think he started off pretty happy. It was a good like happy go lucky, and now he's just anxious. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, tuning into the episode today. If you'd like to hear more from us, please, you know, follow and like our Instagram page, our Twitter page, and our Facebook page at IsFitsHappy, or you can email us directly at IsFitsHappy.com, nope, or you can email us directly at IsFitsHappy at gmail.com, or uh, check out the, uh, the new episodes that we will be posting still every week at IsFitsHappy.com. It's always great hearing from you guys, and we look forward to seeing what we get sent this week. Yeah. Yeah.